Hi friends, welcome to the Wild Side. I'm Steve Hall. If bees disappeared from the face of the earth, man would only have four years left to live. Those are the words of a Belgian poet and playwright who also wrote that no creature, not even man, has achieved what bees have achieved. Now we won't try to prove those powerful words, but we will say that bees are important pollinators for the world's food supply. So it seems only natural we should try to preserve and protect them. And what better place to do that than in state parks? Fearlessly encroaching upon a colony of buzzing bees without protective covering comes with the confidence Chris Warren gained as a little kid. Yeah, I mean, it started when I was really young. Uh, I was a, a bug kid, and so always playing with bugs. And I always had the habit of going out into the field, and I would catch honeybees, thinking that I could make a hive out of them. Until later years, you realize that's not how the hive happens. So it's no surprise that as an adult, Chris keeps beehives in his own backyard. What made it interesting is now, loving bugs, I get to play with them. Uh, What I had to realize is they can live on their own. So the less you work with them, the better off they are. But it was just great to watch them uh, pollinate, uh, bringing in food, and of course, getting the honey product out of it is always uh, wonderful for myself, my family, and friends. And as part of the management team with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, Chris started sharing his passion and a plan with his colleagues. I was one of many voices, but since where I work, I had the opportunity to work with multiple teams. Joining TDEC and having the opportunity to visit these parks and seeing that, loving honeybees, I started talking to some of the operations, asking, is this something that we can look at as many parks having them so we can work as one so we can share practices and so that is how the idea started to blossom that idea in 2018 led to state funding and launch of the honey project with placement of bee colonies in seven parks a second grant in 2019 allowed nine more parks to buy bees it's kind of fun they're uh they're pretty pretty amazing creatures they uh they get in there and um they they make a lot of great honey, which is uh, obviously uh, most people like, um, but they uh, they pretty much do their own thing and um, everything they do has a purpose. What made it so exciting was how other parks were like, we want to do this, we want to do this. Some of the parks didn't even come through with, with grants. They were able through a community to raise money to have hives. By mid 2020, more than half of Tennessee's 56 state parks had invested in bees. We're trying to turn this into an educational, interpretive opportunity. Uh, We've got a couple of different displays of wildlife that they can come look at birds, but we also want to incorporate the honeybees. Ultimately, we'd love to have an observation hive to where the observation hive would be inside our park office to where people can come in and see through a glass plate the actual bees working. Some of the parks have already started harvesting honey and selling it in their gift shops or at their campgrounds. But while that helps support the park's mission, there's a much bigger picture to this plan. As the Tennessee Department of Agriculture bee expert Mike Studer is quick to explain. It's critical worldwide. It's not just critical here, it's critical everywhere uh, with the problems we're having with them, with the native bees and with the honey bees. Some people say, oh, big, no big deal, but I mean, Basically, all you'll be eating is corn and potatoes if we don't have bees. Pretty much everything else is pollinated in some way by bees. Better uh, pollination for plants in in the park, Um, but it's also in the decrease in numbers in uh, honeybees throughout the United States, so it kind of helps out too. Pretty much uh, everything we eat from plants to animals that eat plants, um, uh, honeybees or pollinators have a step in that process. Before we really had the honey project in state parks, we've had some bees here at Horton. Uh, and that was mostly to pollinate our gardens that we had here. Uh, I don't know if many people know that about Henry Horton, but we grow a large portion of our vegetable produce that's served in the restaurant. Everything's connected. Everybody's connected when you think about it. Um, you, you can't separate one out without, without having the other one. I mean, you can't have agriculture without having bees. You can't have parks without having bees, without having plants, without having agriculture. Technically, you're growing anything, it's agriculture. But keeping bees also has its challenges. We're here because uh, they had one colony here at the park that was not as strong as the other one. We wanted to look and see what's going on with it. One hive was really, really strong. We took um, about a gallon and a half of honey off of it this year. Uh, And that 
being its first year, I was pretty impressed with. And uh, the second hive barely was making enough honey that I thought it would be able to make it through the winter. So I wanted to get Mike out to give me a little knowledge and show me what, maybe what I was doing wrong here with these. Mike Studer begins his investigation at Henry Horton State Park by checking the health of the queen bee. She's the one with a white spot on her back. It's a paint mark we put on her, they put on her to, to make sure they could find her easier. Yeah, she looks good. I mean, she's nice and big. She's laying like crazy. It looks pretty good. I mean, it needs some food, you know. There's not much blooming out here right now, so they're, they're short on food supply, and that may be part of the problem that it's having. It looks like they're cannibalizing some of the brood because they don't have enough enough uh, honey in there to feed on. I recommended them that they feed them, and they feed that colony, give them some sugar syrup until the, the fall flow gets going good. And then once the, all the fall asters and goldenrod get blooming good, uh, they should be fine. Bees eating their own brood for survival is apparently common, and is just one of many characteristics that intrigues their keepers. I would say the most fascinating thing I found out with honeybees is how they work as one. You have one queen, Right? She's a female and she's the only fertile uh, bee in the hive. With that, she is responsible to ensure that the hive continues to exist. Because the majority of workers during the summer and spring times only last four to six weeks, because they literally work themselves to death, she has to lay between 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day, especially during nectar flow, to make sure that the hive continues. The workers, which is a majority of them, and I would say out of a hive, 99% of that hive. In a, in a growing hive, you're looking at, at prime time, 40 to 60,000 bees in one colony. So those are the ones that grab the pollen, uh, grab the nectar, uh, make sure that the hive is safe from predators, uh, ensure that it's cooled down or heated up as necessary, keeping a constant temperature there for their brood, uh, making the honey. The drones are simply males that are utilized to reproduce other hives. They go out every day searching for virgin queens to take care of other colonies to ensure that the bees continue to go. Their life is over once they mate, right? It's one time and they're done. Many times you can compare that to the best working environment. Individuals who understand what they need to do, do the best what they can do, and ensure that they're all on the same mission or goal. And that's why it fascinates me. It, no matter what, no matter what hive I have, they understand what they need to do and they take care of business. And the business of bees in Tennessee just keeps getting bigger. Tennessee's Wild Side, broadcast for nearly two decades, was originally created through a vision of the Jackson Foundation. The foundation remains a supportive partner in the mission to educate viewers about wildlife, natural resources, and opportunities for outdoor adventure. Wildside is produced by Rockwater TV with support from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, promoting wise uses of Tennessee's agricultural and forest resources to develop economic opportunities and ensure safe and dependable food, fuel, and fiber for all citizens. And with support from Tennessee State Parks, where you can camp by the riverside, retreat to the mountains, and escape the busyness of life. From Memphis to Kingsport, you'll find the perfect adventure in Tennessee State Parks.